for you to go. Well, good evening, everyone. This came on rather by surprise, but uh, I had prepared this word for an assembly in our area. And then when I finished it, the thought came to me, this also would be suitable for uh, if I'm asked again to speak on something to do with revival on a Saturday night. And then this morning, or, or was it yesterday that uh, Mark asked if anybody had something and I waited until we had about two minutes left to answer if we were going to answer. And the Lord seemed to be saying, make the offer. So that got arranged quickly like that. But I'd like to read three verses toward the end of the epistle to the Ephesians, Ephesians 6 and beginning at verse 18. It's at the end of the list of the spiritual weapons that we have that are called the armor of God. And in verse Beginning at verse 18, we read, Praying at all times with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and being watchful for this purpose in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me in opening my mouth to make known with boldness the secret of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in preaching it I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. And may the Lord speak to us with this passage from his word. So it goes without saying that if one army has a secret weapon that makes things extra dangerous for its enemy, in the, if we know that an enemy has a certain weapon, then it's quite possible we might be able to prepare to resist it. In fact, in today's warfare, if one country knows that its enemy has a certain weapon, sometimes it can actually intercept that weapon before it arrives and does any damage. But if a country, if an enemy country has a secret weapon, well, there's no way of preparing to resist it. Well, in our spiritual warfare, I believe we can call prayer our secret weapon, even though it isn't called a secret weapon in the passage. In fact, it isn't even called a weapon, but we are assured that we can consider it to be our secret weapon uh, because first of all, it comes right after this list of what are called weapons like the uh, uh, breastplate of righteousness or the shield of faith or the helmet of salvation. It come, then prayer comes right after. And also Paul, exhorted his uh, readers in two places to strive in prayer. He, he exhorted the Romans to strive together in prayer with him, and he exhorted the Colossians. Well, in the King James at first, he uh, said, we, I know of your labors in prayer for me, but in the Greek text, the word for labors is the same word as for strive in Romans 15.30. So, these are two reasons to consider prayer a weapon, and a reason to call it a secret weapon is that uh, of all well, Christ told us, we, and God's word indicates that we can pray in all kinds of circumstances, but the circumstances in Christ, in which uh, Christ most recommended to pray are when we're all alone and hidden from view, because he said, when you pray, enter into your interior room, and having shut your door, Pray to your father who is in secret. And in fact, I'd even go so far as to say that a prayer life in which that form of secret prayer is not in primary use is of little value. Our prayer life is of little value unless a large part of it consists of that secret prayer all alone with God. Now, many, many books have been written on prayer. I've heard Christians say there are too many. Many, many sermons have been preached on prayer, and, and some say there are, it's, there's too much of it. But be that as may, as it may, we often hear Christians talk in such a way that seems to indicate that the message about prayer isn't getting through very well, such as when many spiritual activities have been tried to accomplish something and nothing seems to have worked, then we say, well, all there's left to do is pray. And so just that. Uh, not much left, but 
That's what we've got left to try. Or if a person who is chronically sick or shut in expresses regret that he can't uh, get involved in doing very much for the Lord, then uh, Christians will tell him, well, at least you can pray. As so, though uh, to say, well, that isn't much, but at least you can do that. And this reveals a notion that prayer is to be used as a last resort to return to if nothing else works. The truth is that prayer ought to be our first resort. It's what we should do before entering any other activity for the Lord to try to accomplish something in service. And uh, prayer is what we ought to depend on most because it's how we can reach our only source of power. So let's meditate then on how to wield this secret weapon of prayer in order to make great advances in the spiritual battle that we're called to fight. So we learn then from verse 18 that to wield prayer as a secret weapon imposes responsibilities. Verse 18 tells us of some responsibilities that we have because we're using prayer as a secret weapon. The word prayer is a rather general term for all kinds of communication with God, or in a more specific sense, it means asking of God, asking. But the word supplication has a tone rather of urgency to it. So that if we pray and we detect that, well, it's an emergency situation, or it's very urgent that God intervene, well, then we supplicate him. And we're given the responsibilities of doing both. Pray, and then if we sense that there's an urgency in it, well, then supplicate, plead with the Lord, or uh, make, make it intense. And one who is to pray, of course, must believe that God hears and answers, and he must make sure that there's no sin in his life that's undealt with, and that would be hindering his prayer from reaching God. And he needs to be sensitive to any particular urgency and show that he cares about it enough to double up in prayer when called for. And we're also told in verse 18 to pray in the Spirit, that is, be inspired or led by the Spirit as what to pray for. Not just pray, Lord, do this and do that, or give me this and give me that, but let the Holy Spirit lay on our hearts what to pray for. Many people, I think especially people who are religious but lost, but even many true believers have an erroneous notion about how prayer works. They think that prayer begins with us and that we uh, we present an idea that we have thought up to God in prayer, and then if God agrees that it's a good idea, then he'll grant it. That's a very common but erroneous notion about how prayer works. The truth about how prayer works is that it does not begin with us, it begins with God, because God lays on our hearts to pray for a certain thing, and then as we pray for it, we become channels for the will of God, and nothing either begins nor ends in a channel, it just passes through. But when we pray for what God has laid on our hearts, then his will passes through us, and then it returns to him, and on the way back to God, the Holy Spirit edits it to make it acceptable to God, because we don't know how, what to pray for or how, as we ought. In other words, we don't know in ourselves how to pray acceptably, but the Holy Spirit edits our prayers to make them acceptable to God, as the scripture says, with groanings that can't be expressed. So that's how prayer actually works. If it's true prayer, it begins with God, it passes through us as a channel as we pray, and then it returns to God, edited by the Holy Spirit, and then God grants it. And that's why uh, many stories are told about how some Christian sensed that the Lord was laying on his heart to pray, just urged him to pray so that he couldn't resist. He had no idea what the need was, but he prayed that uh, God would answer that need, whatever it was. And then later on, he would learn that just at that very moment that he felt that urge to pray, 
there was some particular need that the Lord answered, an answer to that prayer. I'll, I'll give you only one example. It's the most recent one that I've heard of, although it's far from being the only one. But one of our missionaries by the name of Nate Bramson was driving a carload of evangelists in Nigeria. And all of a sudden, a group of terrorists jumped out into the road and laid a pile of tires in front of Nate's car and beside it so that he would be trapped that way. Well, we can be sure that he prayed, but a taxi driver who was right behind Nate noticed or perceived that if he were to back up as far as he could, then Nate would be able to back up far enough to get around the wall of tires on the side of the car and get away. So that's what the taxi driver did. And Nate caught on and he backed up right to the taxi. And then he got around the wall of tires to the side and got away. So Nate went to the police station and reported the incident. And then when he got home, he got on the internet because Nate had prayer partners all across the United States from coast to coast. And he emailed every one of them and asked him, were you praying for me last night? Because when it was a daytime in Nigeria, it was night in North America. And every one of those prayer partners that Nate contacted and asked, Did, were you praying for me last night? He said, I sure was. What happened? Because the Lord woke me up at such a time and urged me to pray for you until I was sure you were all right. So Nate asked everyone or took note of what time every one of his prayer partners said the Lord had wakened him up and took note of what time zone that prayer partner was in and found that in every single case, the Lord woke up that prayer partner at the very moment that the terrorists were piling the tires in front of and beside his car. So it shows that the prayer began with God because the Lord saw the urgent need of Nate and his fellow evangelists and then he laid it on the heart of his prayer partners to pray at that moment. So that's what praying in the spirit then is, being sensitive and alert for God to lay things on our heart to pray for. And those who pray must watch for developments in God's answer and see if there's anything that would indicate any modification in the, the content of the prayer and also to be sensitive for any encouragements that we could take in the developments that we see. And don't forget to thank God for any encouragements that come. So praying, but watching as well. Nehemiah gives us an example of watching and praying when he was building the wall of Jerusalem with, his, uh, with the men under his direction. Mm. And he says, we made our prayer to God Nehemiah 4 and verse 9, we made our prayer to God and set a watch against them, that is the enemies, day and night. And then verse 17, they all built the wall and those who bore burdens loaded themselves. Everyone worked at the building with one of his hands and held his weapon with the other hand. That is uh, working for God, uh, but also keeping watch for the enemy and alert and, and ready to use our secret weapon of prayer. And we're told to pray with all perseverance because prayer can take a lot of perseverance if it takes time for the answer to come. We who meet on this call daily to pray for revival, we've been at it for more than four years now and we still don't have the answer, but are we going to call it and say, well, I guess, I must have been mistaken. It, it isn't God's will to send revival after all. Not at all. We're going to keep on. And in fact, I'm totally convinced that the fact that God has laid it on the hearts of so many Christians to pray for a revival is all the assurance we need that it is God's will. And therefore, we must persevere until we get the answer. As I've uh, had an interest in revival off and on ever since I was young, and I've known other Christians who did wish that the Lord would send one, but I've never before in all my life know, found so many Christians all at one time were exercised to pray for revival. And to me, that means the Lord wants to send one. And prayer begins with him. 
He has laid it on all our hearts, but it's going to pass through us as channels and return to him, and he'll answer by sending one. And in fact, Christ uh, taught two parables about perseverance, the one about the man who went to his friend's house at midnight and asked, could you lend me three loaves of bread? And he was going to knock at that door until the friend got up and answered the door and, gave, and yeah, gave him the three loaves of bread. And the other is the widow who came to a judge who didn't care about justice, but she kept on pleading with him, please uh, do justice to me because I'm being mistreated. And finally, the judge saw that, that he'd just have to put up with her getting after him and after him and after him until he answered. And he said, if a judge who, does, who couldn't care less about justice would answer perseverance, how much more your heavenly father who loves you and who wants to answer. And then Christ taught us, literally translated, keep on asking and it will be given you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and it will be opened to you. So those are the responsibilities that wielding prayer as a secret weapon imposes on us. But wielding prayer as a secret weapon, besides imposing responsibilities on us, it also requires humility, as verse 19 points out. Because here Paul asked the Ephesian Christians to pray for him. Just imagine, the Apostle Paul was asking these Christians uh, to pray for him. And yet it was probably through his gospel preaching that all of them had first learned how to be saved. So they owed their knowledge of the way of salvation to him. And yet he's asking them to pray for him. Doesn't that sound like quite a condescension on Paul's part? In fact, uh, yes, Paul had labored for a long time in Ephesus when he was there. We read in Acts chapter 19 and verse 8, he, that is Paul, entered into the synagogue and spoke boldly for a period of three months, reasoning and persuading the people about the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and resistant, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, and this continued for two years, so that all those who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So for three months, Paul preached in the synagogue, preaching the gospel every Sabbath. And then after he found that the people in that audience were hard-hearted and wouldn't listen, then he got the use of a school, and he preached in that school daily for two years. And all that was what had led the Ephesians to Christ and to salvation. So they owed their knowledge of the way of salvation to Paul. Now, how much longer do you think Paul had been saved than any of the Ephesian Christians? Well, according to the best efforts that have been made to calculate New Testament chronology, and this chronology takes a year 7 BC as the year of Christ's birth, because uh, it's now known that the, there was an error to think that the year zero was the year of Christ's birth. And for a long time, uh, people thought it was the year 4 BC. But now most chronologists uh, are of the, of the uh, opinion that Christ was born in 7 BC. So with that idea, it seems that Paul got saved on the Damascus Road in 33 AD, and that he went to Ephesus in 54 AD. And then he wrote the epistle to the Ephesians, as well as a few other epistles, when he was under house arrest in Rome, waiting his trial, and that seems to have been in 62 AD. So from that data, then, we figure out that when Paul wrote the epistle to the Ephesians, he had been saved probably for 29 years, and none of the Ephesian Christians could have been saved any longer than eight years at the time. So Paul had three and a half times as many years of Christian life behind him as any of the Ephesian Christians could have had, but for some of them it was likely less. And yet, here was Paul saying to them, you pray for me, I need your prayers. 
by their condescension. And when Paul asked the Ephesian Christians to pray for him and pray that he would have the courage to open his mouth boldly, but what do you think any of them knew of boldness in preaching in comparison with what Paul had demonstrated when he was in Ephesus and that the uh, leaders of a factory that made idolatrous trinkets to worship the goddess Artemis with uh, got upset and they caused a violent riot in Ephesus. Anything to make a man scared to preach the gospel, but Paul had dared to preach in such a situation and even though the Christians kept him back from going to address the mob that had gathered, all the same, he was ready to do that. Well, what had any of the Ephesian Christians known of braving dangers compared to that? And yet Paul says to them, you pray for me for boldness to open my mouth about the gospel. And Paul asked for them to pray for help for him in explaining what he called the secret of the gospel. That is, in most translations, it says the, uh, the mystery of the gospel. But in the scriptures, that word doesn't mean something mysterious. It rather means something that's a secret known only to the, initiate, the initiated. Our Lord uh, and the Apostle Paul took uh, an illustration there from lodges, not that he that uh, God would approve of lodges, but just that it illustrates that most lodges are sworn to secrecy and they'll let, make the secrets known only to those who have gone through certain initiation rites to become members of them. One summer when I was a student I, and I was working at a summer job, the church I attended that summer rented the built the basement of the Masonic Hall, a hall that belonged to Freemasons, but we never got to see the main floor because it was closed with a big, massive wooden door with a tiny little peephole in it through which a leader of that uh, lodge would uh, watch anyone who came to the door to see if he was one of the initiated and whether to let him in and learn their secrets or not. Well, that's where the illustration comes from. So what is the secret of the gospel then? Well, it is that Salvation by grace alone becomes believable when we're enlightened and grasp the secret because uh, it, it tells us that God can take the worst of sinners and transform them into saints so that you'd never know what they had once been. And he can win from them a devotion that could never have been won by requiring them to work for their salvation because grace wins devotion so much better. But uh, that's an enlightenment that can never be gained by school education, nor by natural intelligence. Only the Holy Spirit living in us can give us that enlightenment. Now, Paul writes in chapter 3 that God specially gave that enlightenment to him. It was to him to make known the secret of the gospel and particularly the great truths of the church. And yet he writes to the Ephesian Christians, pray for me that God will, you pray for me that God will help me to make known that secret of the gospel. So if we had been there with Paul as he wrote that, wouldn't we have been inclined to reason like John the Baptist when Christ came to him and asked for baptism? And John the Baptist said, I need to be baptized by thee, and thou comest to me? And we'd have been inclined to say, uh, Paul, the Ephesian Christians need for you to pray for them, and you're asking them to pray for you? What condescension! Furthermore, when Paul asked them to pray that he would speak with boldness, the word for boldness includes not only the idea of courage, but also the idea of confidence and assurance. But didn't, have, didn't Paul have plenty to give him assurance? After all, he had studied under Gamaliel, a man who had the prestige that a university professor has today. Whereas the main economy, the economy that's, that sustained all the city of Ephesus, was that manufacture of idolatrous trinkets that were sold in the temple. It's the very same idea as St. Anne de Beaupre in uh, 
Quebec, about an hour's drive east of Quebec City, or like Lourdes in France, where the economy of the city is sold on, on the selling Roman Catholic gadgets that uh, are supposed to have miraculous power. Well, so probably most of the Ephesians Christians then were factory workers, or perhaps uh, worked selling those idolatrous trinkets. Probably none of them were any near to being as educated as Paul was. But Paul said, when I came to Christ, I counted all those advantages that I had as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And so he asked these Ephesians, who probably had um, only an elementary education, pray that I will speak with assurance, because I'm not counting on eloquence that comes from school education or from natural talent. I'm counting on the enabling of the Spirit to speak boldly. And furthermore, the Ephesian Christians weren't the only relatively young Christians whom Paul asked to pray for him. He asked the Corinthians to pray for him only five years after they had heard the gospel for the first time, and they had had many serious problems in their church. And he asked the Thessalonians to pray for him only one year after they had heard the gospel for the first time. So all this shows that no matter how mature in faith a Christian may be, he still needs the prayers of his fellow believers. And it shows that no matter how young in the faith a Christian may be, God still wants him to pray. And he ought not to feel that he's unworthy to pray for those who are much more advanced in the Christian life than he is, because the acceptability of our prayers isn't based on worthiness on our part. None of us have any. It's based strictly on grace. And remember that the Holy Spirit edits our prayers to make them acceptable to God. So great humility is required to wield our secret weapon of prayer. But to wield prayer as a secret spiritual weapon, it imposes responsibilities. It also requires humility, and it furthermore wins victories, as verse 20 tells us. But victories because God's ways are not our ways, and God's thoughts are different from our thoughts. And Paul here describes himself as an ambassador in chains. Now, that's something that throughout all history, and still today, is supposed to be considered unthinkable an ambassador who's chained, because an ambassador, according to international civilities, is supposed to be considered untouchable. He must be treated with respect no matter where he is. If one country is planning to make war on another, before it goes to war against that country, it will withdraw its ambassadors from that country. And any ambassadors from that country that may be in it It'll send them home before declaring war on that other country, because the ambassadors are supposed to be considered untouchable, always to be treated with respect. Nobody's to molest them or harm them in any way. That's why David was so scandalized and so outraged when he sent his ambassadors to the Moabite king, uh, the, the, the Ammonite king, Hanan, to express sympathy for the death of his father. But the Ammonite princes said, oh, we can't trust these ambassadors. And so they cut off half their beards, which was an insult to a Jew. And they cut off the bottom half of their clothes. And David said, well, he was just totally outraged by that because they were molesting ambassadors. Well, same today, an ambassador is supposed to be untouchable. So Paul was in a situation then that he portrays as being something that should be considered unthinkable, and yet here he was in it. Paul hadn't committed any crime, and yet and he had simply been, been trying to spread the gospel so that souls could be saved, but here he is, a prisoner. But he maintains a victorious attitude all the same and asks the Ephesians Christians to Pray that he'll be able to open his mouth boldly and with assurance. And that's 
exactly what has come out in so many stories of martyrdoms, that those who put martyrs to death were the type whom you just couldn't reason with. They wouldn't listen to reason. And so they do what should have been unthinkable things. I'll give only one example, although many, many could be given. It's an example I recently read of. It happened in the year 1569, when the Reformation was taking place in parts of Europe, but Holland was still under the dominion of Roman Catholicism. And a man by the name of, a Dutchman by the name of Dirk Willems had been known to have embraced the true faith, the evangelical faith. And so the emperor of what was called the Holy Roman Empire was out for his blood. While in Holland, there was a certain type of official who was known as a thief catcher because he was a, an excellent runner, so he could run after thieves and usually catch them. And he saw Dirk Willems, and so he ran to catch him. But Dirk Willems also was a good runner, and he managed to keep just out of reach of the thief catcher. And he ran across a river that was iced over. All the way across, he heard the ice cracking under him, but he got across with the thief catcher just a short distance behind him. And then all of a sudden, just as he got onto land on the other side of that river, he heard a big crack and that thief catcher fell into the, the ice cold water and was struggling to get out from under the ice and just couldn't. Well, Dirk Williams could have run away then and gotten away and left that thief catcher to drown. But he sensed that the Lord was telling him, rescue the man. So he went back to the thief catcher and threw out his cloak, one end of it, so the thief catcher could catch one end while he held the other. And he pulled him out from under the ice to safety. Well, that thief catcher had been a very hard man, but that act of grace touched his heart and melted it. And so Mr. Willems gave him a brief explanation of the gospel, told him that God loved him and wanted to save him. But the mayor of Amsterdam was watching all that scene on the other side of the river. And he called out to the thief catcher, grab that man before he gets away. And the thief catcher called back to him, please let him go. He just finished saving my life. He's a good man. But the mayor called out to him, I don't care what he did. He's a heretic and an enemy of the Holy Mother Church, so we must get him. Well, the thief catcher realized that if he didn't bring Willems, he himself would be executed. So he brought him, and Dirk Willems was burned at the stake when he could have gotten away by refusing to show grace to his captor. Now, of course, that shows the power of grace, but it also shows us that we can expect to have to deal with a world that is constantly doing unthinkable things. And the laws of our land are moving more and more in that direction now. About uh, how, uh, uh, how uh, Christians are to be treated when we have a prime minister who has said publicly that the world be, it would be a better place if all evangelicals are eliminated from the face of the earth. And there's a law that if a doctor is faced with one person with a heart condition, so he, if he doesn't get surgery immediately, he'll die. And then alongside of him is somebody wanting a transgender operation. According to law, that, that doctor has to give the priority to the person who's wanting the transgender operation. Our law says that now in Canada. And the state of California now has a law that a church can't refuse membership to a person because of his sexual orientation. That's the way our laws are moving today. And we feel like crying out, what have we done to be treated this way? Aren't we the people who obey the laws, whether we're being watched or not, and who do our work, whether our employers are present or not, and who can be counted on to do to uh, keep our word and to pay our taxes without cheating? What have we done that we should be treated this way? And furthermore, the preaching of the gospel has so often resulted in social reforms and getting rid of other abuses.
and yet the freedoms and the privileges that we have had in the past, well, they're slowly being eroded. Well, it's all examples of how the world is doing things that ought to be considered unthinkable, just like an ambassador who is chained. But Paul, in his unthinkable circumstances, had a triumphant attitude, still wanting prayer that he'd be able to speak boldly as he ought. Now, how are we to maintain that victorious attitude and keep on serving God, even if we're treated unjustly in a way that would formerly have been considered unthinkable? The only way we can do it is by constant communion with God through prayer and through praying one for another. That's how to wield our secret weapon in order to win victories. Yes, a secret weapon makes warfare extra dangerous for the enemy because it can't prepare to resist it or overcome it. But in our spiritual warfare, prayer is our secret weapon. Even though it isn't called a secret weapon or even a weapon in the text, but it's listed so promptly after other spiritual weapons, and we're exhorted to strive in prayer, and the circumstance in which Christ most highly recommended that we engage in prayer is when we're all alone, all alone and hidden in view, alone with God. So let's remember the words of a hymn by William Cooper, in which he said, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. And William Cooper, who wrote that hymn, might very well have felt like the weakest saint, because through most of his child and his teenage years, he lived in a boarding school where he got bullied an awful lot, especially by, by a boy who was nine years older than he, and he got a lot of other abusive treatment to the extent that for the rest of his life, he was plagued with tendencies to depression and mental illness. But John Newton took that man under his wing and, and helped him in his walk with the Lord and learned to appreciate him and told others of what a close walk that man William Cooper has with God. He really knows God. So yes, Cooper might very well have felt like the weakest saint, but he knew God and he prayed and he knew how to tap the power of God. And it was he who wrote, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. If we are to wield prayer as a secret weapon that imposes responsibilities on us, it also requires humility and it wins victories. So let us then value and use this secret spiritual weapon in order to put Satan's armies to flight and to serve God effectively because Christ's soldiers fight best on their knees. Our blessed Lord God, we have come to thee for exactly that reason, because we believe that our secret weapon is prayer. Satan doesn't realize and never will realize the power that there is in this weapon. And therefore, we have gathered to use it to fight our spiritual warfare. And this is what thou hast laid it on our hearts to do as our part toward the coming of a revival. Only thou hast the power to send one, but we can tap that power through this secret spiritual weapon of prayer that thou hast given us. May we see the send a great revival and do wonderful works in our day for thy glory in the name of our most blessed and worthy Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.